Baleo artists, grab your pens, pencils, paints, or tablets. It's time to explore another shade of our palettes in prehistory. Last time I discussed known pigments in the fossil record of avian and non-avian dinosaurs. This time we'll discuss color, but not a type of color which is produced within any kind of measly cell. I'm going to discuss structural color. The vibrant metallic sheen which amazes the inane. The amazing bejeweled coats which bring tears to the artistically pretentious. And the oily films which passively entertain the brains of cantankerous juveniles. There's more to the natural world and what we see of it than simply browns, blacks, greys, and reds. How is it that some animals can reflect the might of the sun in dazzling arrays of metallic sheens and hues? Let's find out, shall we? Structural Color A very important part to how modern dinosaurs use their feathers has nothing to do with the colored pigment they lock away within their feathers. The color, or should I say, condition, to which I refer so eloquently, is iridescence. Broadly described as the phenomenon structural color, this kind of reflective metallic sheen is the product of the structural characteristics of the feathers themselves. Of course, this metallic sheen is not exclusive to the feathers of the rather diminutive dinosaurs which populate our backyards and zoos. Iridescence is present in just about every single group of organisms alive today. As such, there's a bunch of different ways all of these groups of living, breathing beasts produce these sheens. In modern dinosaur feathers, iridescence occurs when microscopic interlocking barbules of the feather have a microscopic double layer of melanosomes which split the light which passes through it into different colors. Not unlike the crystal prism your chemistry or physics teacher used to explain the concept of light. Different lengths between these layers produce different effects. Structural color is not unique to birds, as the morpho butterfly can easily testify. As such, I think we need to know more about structural color before we can reconstruct our dinosaurs with it. Structural color can be divided into two subgroups, fixed structures and variable structures. Fixed structures, as the name suggests, involves one physical structure unchanging in general shape or angle. The angle at which the structure is held and the angle at which light hits the structure is the only thing which visually changes the color of the structure. Fixed structures include diffraction gratings, selective mirrors, photonic crystals, crystal fibers, deformed matrices, and spiral coils. Some of these structures are a single film, other times they're composed of many layers of films. The more you have, the stronger the iridescence since there's more layers to refract more light. Two colors can be combined together by utilizing different pigment layers and refractive layers and fixed structures can even be arranged in order to produce a singular color that doesn't change with a change in angle. Diffraction Grating Diffraction grating is the science word which describes a structure with multiple layers. Perhaps the whole layer thing is too vague. When I say layer, I mean it like a layer of skin. The outside of whatever structure I'm talking about is the skin which covers the inside materials. Pigments can be stored in any number of layers which make up this outside skin and structures which refract and reflect color are present in these layers as well. The outside layers of skin, feathers, hair, and scales used by vertebrates are primarily made up of the protein keratin. The outside layers of skin, scales, and armor among the invertebrates are primarily made of chitin and or cartilage. When it comes to the feathers of modern dinosaurs, diffraction grating works with three layers, the keratinous outer layer of the feather, then a layer of microscopic air bubbles, and a melanosome layer at the bottom. 
Every shade of the color blue used by birds is the result of this kind of structure. Some birds have feathers which use this technique but don't reflect any iridescence. The blue light bounces around the air bubbles and reflects back out the keratin. The black melanosomes of the bottommost layer absorb the rest of the light colors hitting the feather. The birds with this kind of structure produce vibrant hues which don't change color when the angle of the light which hits it changes. These are perfectly exemplified within the feathers of blue jays and blue tits. Parrots use a very unique type of pigment in their feathers to recreate different colors and shades, but their blue is the result of structure. The hyacinth macaw, known for its azure feathers and yellow facial skin, uses a non-iridescent diffraction grating. This macaw, known to science as Andorhynchus hyacinthinus, is responsible for spreading the seeds of over 18 plant species native to Brazil. They are therefore important aspects of the ecosystem and use their bright blue colors to communicate with other members of their species. Kingfishers can offer us another treat of eye candy to show the use of structural blues. Though not all, many have patches of blue to green feathers with a lack of iridescence. As cute as they are, they're ruthless predators who bash their prey to death against any hard material they can find. The Laughing Kookaburra, one of the many symbols of Australia dripping with iconography, is more than its silly call might initially reflect. Some members of this species, Dasilo novae guineae, have very small patches of pale blue structural color in their wing feathers but are generally colored mostly by melanin. The common kingfisher, Alcedo atthus of Eurasia, is one type of kingfisher which takes blue to a whole nother level. Much of its plumage is decked out in teal and cerulean and does not iridesce in light, though some of the lighter arctic blue highlights look a little reflective to me. True to their name, the common kingfisher is a main predator of fish. They too take them up to a higher place and bash their catch to death with the hope of breaking their spines to presumably make them a bit easier to swallow whole. Another approach critters use to produce diffraction gratings is with tree-shaped arrays of chitin. On the microscopic level, the outer layer of the chitin scales, which make up the skin of an insect, fold in on themselves many times into a tree-like shape. A wonderfully clear example lies in the almost alien blue of the morpho butterfly's wings. Many species of the morpho genus are sexually dimorphic. Only the males have the iridescent blue inner wing. It's hypothesized that they use these flashy wings to signal to other males and females. These butterflies can see into the ultraviolet light spectrum, and their reflective wings also reflect UV light, therefore making them even better communication devices. Unfortunately for our dinosaur-centered paleoart discussion, these structures reflecting the blue of amorphos' wings does not occur in any modern bird group, making it rather implausible in extinct dinosaurs. Another take on this structural color type is that used by the Laws' Parotia bird of paradise, Parotia lausii. The bird's breast feathers have microscopic V-shaped barbules. These barbules create a thin film microstructure which strongly reflects two distinct colors, an eye-bleeding blue-green and a calmer orange-yellow. This dichotomy exists to help the male bird in his courtship display. The bird moves his chest side to side and the colors switch from blue to yellow. This type of structure is therefore a product of sexual selection. At some point, a female was attracted to a watered-down version of this reflective patch, and over time, more flamboyant males were born, which were then more favorably picked by females, which were continuously born with an attraction for that visual display until these birds could no longer reproduce with the original population of birds. Accompanying these birds in their courtship displays is a Jurassic Park Dilophosaur-like frill of feathers which they raise with the help of muscles attached to the base of their breast and neck feathers. With them, they become a big black dot with a reflective center to make sure they catch the female's eye. Thin feathers ending in round tips enhance the dizzying circular effect as the bird dances around its forest floor stage. Such structures enlist exactly no evidence within the fossil record of avian and non-avian dinosaurs. 
This doesn't mean it hasn't occurred before in the 180 million years of the non-avian dinosaurs, but occurring in exactly these colors and shapes is a pill too hard for me to swallow. Go ahead and reconstruct something like this in your paleo art if you wish, just don't make it look like you copied as these birds are very sensitive. Though no fossils show a dichotomous diffractive grating like the bird of paradise, there are two specimens considered to preserve traces of fixed structure, structural color. Microraptor, the inappropriately dubbed flying four-winged raptor, was one of the earlier finds cementing the idea of truly non-avian dinosaurs with complex advanced feathers. In 2012, Chinese paleontologists took the electron microscope technique to the fossils of a microraptor specimen. The pigments they found within the preserved feathers were sausage-shaped eumelanin melanosomes, corresponding to black shades in the feathers of modern dinosaurs. In addition, these sausage-shaped melanosomes were stacked on top of one another, very similar to those pigments which create structural iridescence in modern dinosaurs, like the common magpie or raven. Not an ultra-metallic reflectivity, but a calmer gloss. The thickness of the outside keratin layer is unknown, making it impossible to know the exact color of iridescence reflected from the black feathers. The researchers were unable to infer what they used this iridescence for, but many have assumed it might have done like living iridescent birds and used it for communication and sexual display. The second iridescent non-avian dinosaur was described in 2018 as Kai Hong. Unlike the dromaeosaur microraptor, Kai Hong is an anchiornithid. This means it was part of the most primitive group of which could be considered birds. The melanosomes found in the specimen's feathers are flattened into a platelet-like form, or a flat poker chip shape. This shape was first thought to most closely resemble the melanosomes in the iridescence of living hummingbirds. A black-colored eumelanin was present throughout the body, with platelets concentrated in the head, neck, breast, and base of the tail. Unlike the structural color of hummingbirds, the platelets of Kai Hong are seemingly solid and lack that middle layer of air bubbles that helps to refract light. Their feathers' reflective properties may have been more similar to those of South American trumpeters. Due to the lack of a bubble layer, but inclusion of all other anatomical details which are present in modern iridescent feathers, we can be relatively certain that these feathers were iridescent, but what colors they iridesced is speculative. To date, no studies have been conducted to show blue structural coloration in fossil feathers. It may simply be that confirmed black pigmented feathers were also iridescent, but the air bubble layer was crushed during fossilization. Those species proven black may have been more blue or purple when they were up and fluttering. Cassowaries use structural color in a different way. The skin on their necks are blue, but not due to pigments produced by the body. Skin can utilize structural color just as keratin sheathed hair and feathers can. They do this with the help of bundles of collagen fibers stacked together to refract blue light. Collagen is the main protein component of connective tissue and helps to keep everything together. It is the most abundant protein produced by mammals and is present in all animals. If you see blue on any part of a bird's body, it's due to structural color. This means that the Lophosaur in your new paleo art piece, or perhaps the portrait of your forest dwelling new Tyrannus, could use the same concept of blue skin. Dr. Chad Eliason and Dr. Julia Clark set out to understand whether and how structural colors are produced in the rather ancient modern dinosaur lineage Paleonithae. This group probably evolved in the Cretaceous period, but the only unambiguous Paleonath fossils come from the Cenozoic era. To this effect, Dr. Eliason and Dr. Clark also compared the living cassowary with the extinct Lithornithid dinosaurs, as they are usually considered early Paleonaths. Some of these lithornithids have had color spectrum analyses done on them, which suggest presence of eumelanin and structural colors. Before I move on, I think it'd be best if I run down the basic structure of a feather and how modern dinosaurs utilize different parts of it for reflective purposes. Feathers are considered some of the most complex integumentary appendages ever produced by a vertebrate animal. Feathers are produced in tiny follicles in the skin, just as our hair sprouts from hair follicles. These follicles produce keratin proteins which form the outside structure of the feather. 
Birds produce two kinds of feathers, veined feathers and downy feathers. Downy feathers are produced by babies and adults retain them underneath their veined feathers for warmth. A downy feather starts out as a single hollow quill, called a rachis. For downy feathers, this structure then sprouts branches made of the same material. A vein feather is rather different. It too starts out as a single hollow tube ending in a point. It then sprouts branches of smaller versions of this hollow keratin tube like a tree. These are called barbs. These branches then form more branches which all interlock with one another, which are called barbules. Modern dinosaurs with glossy feathers can use three mechanisms to structurally color their feathers. Some have the refractive layer in the central rachis, others have the layer in their barbs, while others have the layer in their barbules. Each one creates different effects and are used interchangeably. The common raven is not especially iridescent, but it uses structural color in its barbules. These small hook-like branches splitting off these smaller branches which split off from the central rachis. They have what is called glossy feathers. It has a layer which refracts light like other birds but is not usually as strong. The red-headed woodpecker is an example of a bird which has structural color layers in the barbs of its feathers which are the first branching quills off the main central rachis. As you can see, they are a tad more iridescent than the raven, but still glossy. There's a major difference when you compare this kind of glossy iridescence to the iridescence of a peacock's tail feathers. Dr. Eliason and Dr. Clark found cassowary feathers to have a similar gloss to them due to structural colors. Cassowaries do it differently than the woodpecker or the raven though, they are in fact built different. Their refractive layers are in the central rachis. Unlike the complex veined flight feathers of many bird lineages, the cassowary has narrow hair-like veined feathers. This structure is why they were assumed to lack structural color, until recently that is. This kind of structural color in paleonates is backed up by more ancient lineages of this group. Eliason and Clark used lithornithid fossil specimens from Wyoming to compare with the structural colors they found in modern cassowary feathers. These fossils preserve sausage-shaped eumelanin as well as structures which indicate purple iridescence. There's no reason to think this kind of structure didn't exist in even more ancient lineages of dinosaurs. A glossy sheen to somewhat primitive hair-like feathers is common among these flightless modern dinosaurs and wouldn't be entirely out of place in even more ancient theropods. Photonic Crystals Now we begin moving outside the realm of dinosaurs. I think you'll find the rest of structural colors as interesting. The next type of fixed structure, structural color, is photonic crystals. The emerald patched cattle heart butterfly, Parides sesostris, has wing scales perforated by arrays of microscopic holes into the outer chitin layer. They're arranged in patches of holes and each patch is angled differently. This results in an iridescence that remains exactly the same regardless of the angle of light hitting the scales or the angle at which the scales are oriented. The Brazilian weevil Lamprocyphus augustus offers an example of a different way of using photonic crystals. This amazingly green insect has an exoskeleton covered in oval-shaped scales. The scales have small diamond-based crystals oriented in a latticework system, effectively creating a microscopic pixelated carpet of reflective surfaces, absorbing, refracting, and reflecting light at all angles. This makes the beetle a brilliant iridescent green from any angle. Other weevils like this Pachyrhynchus sanchezi are flightless, hardened little critters with fused elytra. Bespeckling the wing covers are patches of photonic diamond-based crystals. This male has pure blue spots, while this female brandishes a gradient from blue to red. Selective Mirrors The next fixed structure structural color technique is selective mirrors. True to its name, this technique involves thousands of microscopic mirrors. 
the wing scales of the emerald swallowtail butterfly are pitted with thousands of bowl-shaped depressions. Each depression has many layers of chitin lining the bowl, which act as the refractive layer. The selective part of selective mirrors comes into play with the bowl's ability to reflect exactly two wavelengths of light, yellow and blue. The centers of the pits reflect yellow light, while the sides reflect blue twice. Together, from afar, these pits appear green. Crystal Fibers There's a species of worm which lives 9,800 feet 3,000 meters below the surface of the ocean. Unlike your average earthworm, this critter, with the common name sea mouse, belongs to the group of worms called polychaetes. The species of the sea mouse genus Aphrodita have developed a type of iridescence similar to the selective mirrors of the emerald swallowtail butterfly, but differ in a few key ways. The worm protects itself from predation by the large number of iridescent spines sticking out of its body. They look like fiberglass or hair, owing to their potential danger. The outer layer of these fibers is constructed of thousands of hollow, hexagonal chitin tubes clustered together. When light enters the voids, it bounces back and forth between the walls of the tubes and refracts a disgustingly clammy iridescence. These spines act like you stacked 88 of the bird-like diffraction gratings together one of the most purely iridescent structures in any marine organism. Deformed Matrices The brilliant blue retained in the feathers of the blue and yellow macaw, Ara ararana, represent the type of fixed structure structural color known as deformed matrices. Layers of the barbs branching off the central rachis tube of the feather are made of a bunch of randomly oriented tubes called nanochannels. They are surrounded by a spongy keratin matrix that holds them in place and creates the diffuse, non-iridescent blue color of the feathers, but also gives them a radiant blue that does not change color when the angle of refracted light changes. Spiral Coils like some of the other structures, spiral coils involve microfibers or microscopic tubes. In this phenomenon, the tubes are coiled and stacked in a helix formation. This occurs in one species of plant. The most intense blue coloration found in nature belongs to the berries of Polia condensata, or marbleberry. The blue of these berries is stronger than the blue of the morpho butterfly's wings and is one of the first instances of structural coloration known in plants. Another interesting aspect to these berries is that each cell contains its own unique thickness and number of reflective fibers, making each cell reflect slightly different colors to its neighbors. This results in an almost pixelated or pointillist effect when you look at it straight on and twist the fruit around at different angles. A similar effect is found in certain species of scarab beetles. Variable Structures Finally, we've reached the last distinction among structural colors, variable structures. As the opposite to fixed structures, variable structures are structural color created by chromatophores which can manually change reflectivity. This type is most commonly seen in cephalopods which use it both for camouflage and communication. Unlike these structures in other animals that remain fixed in a position and require different orientations of crystals to effect different colors and levels of iridescence, cephalopods use reversible protein switches to change the color and level of iridescence on a whim. In response to mood or situation, the longfin inshore squid uses an electric charge to switch the proteins. No electric charge, the proteins stack together and create iridescence. When the charge is run through these proteins, they become loose and the iridescence is lost. There has been much discourse among paleontologists and paleoartists as to possible limits to structural color imposed by the structure of feathers in non-avian dinosaurs. Many are preserved with primitive feathers called protofeathers or dinofuzz. Unlike the feathers of most modern dinosaurs, these feathers were single branches sticking out of the body much like mammal hairs. Iridescent blues and purples are generally restricted to modern dinosaurs which can fly. This should mean the protofeathered or downy non-avian dinosaurs were restricted to earth tones from melanin, right? 
Yes, but actually no. Though it would be the safer route to reconstruct your non-avian dinosaurs, which sported protofeathers as those colors afforded by melanin alone, there are modern mammals which muddy the waters. The blind sub-Saharan golden moles of the family Chrysochloridae are called golden for a reason. Their blonde, iridescent fur can show up silvery, golden, greenish, or purplish depending on the light and the species. This is their adaptation to endure abrasive sand, which they spend most of their lives swimming through. The only reason to doubt this particular iridescence was not shared by any non-avian dinosaurs is the very specific ecological position the golden moles occupy. They have their iridescence because of the shape and utility of their fur. However, since a simple structure like mammal fur can be iridescent, it means the simple protofeathers of non-avian dinosaurs could also have a similar iridescence. It would probably be due to a different ecological reason though. There's no reason to doubt something similar didn't evolve in protofeathered non-avian dinosaurs. Unlike the golden moles, these protofeathered non-avian dinosaurs could probably see visible in ultraviolet light, thus having the ability to appreciate the iridescence of flattened hair-like feathers. Golden moles aren't the only mammalian example of iridescence either. The short hair of the Akalteke horse breed from Turkmenistan sports a definite metallic sheen. No analysis of the hair has been done yet, but according to the rather unscientific literature written on the breed by breeders, the hair has a transparent inner fiber which refracts light. As you can see, many are golden-hued, while others reflect more copper tones or even rose gold. Interestingly, this breed is also susceptible to something called naked foal syndrome, wherein some are born completely hairless. It has no relevance to this video, just thought it was weird and interesting. These examples of iridescence in simple mammalian filaments tells us not to be so quick to dismiss the possibility of non-avian dinosaurs brandishing such reflective simple plumage. Pterosaurs could be a great example of this since the entire group is known to have been decked out in moderately simple fibrous structures called pycnofibers to keep them warm when they flew. They too would have had the capacity for iridescence. Small to medium-sized tyrannosaurs and early theropods are not out of the question either, nor are early ceratopsians or sauropods, all of which retain the possibility for simple unbranching feather-adjacent filaments covering their hides. Don't be afraid to make them shine. This is the end of our time with structural color. I hope I've outlined the major and minor details which allow you to open your mind to the possibilities of dinosaur colors when reconstructing your antediluvian beasts. This also ends the discussion of color for which we have evidence in the fossil record. Structural color and melanin are it so far, but the modern world is not so simple. Melanins and structural iridescences are but a fraction of the colors which made up the rainbows flaunted by modern dinosaurs. There's no reason to justify non-existence of other colors and pigments in non-avian dinosaurs, and this is where we will go next. Yellows, oranges, reds, purples, and greens are present in many modern dinosaur lineages and many in close association with the colors I've already outlined. Next, we'll be looking at carotenoids, porphyrins, pteridins, and beyond. Next time you pick up your artist's utensils, keep the iridescent awe of structural colors in mind. Only more creativity will follow. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to Elephant Tier patrons Abby Smith, Arda Bayer, Biotiverse, Cherry Shaw, Chris Frampton, Christoph Hubbinger, Dinosaur, Ed Peretz, Isaiah Garza, Jax the Hacks, Natty Cat, PA Brew News, Ray, Rudy Redgrave, Smiling Walrus, Staniforth Hopkins, Steve Bradshaw, Thea Svensson, and Extraterrestrial as well as my top as tier Tyrannosaurus patrons, Admin, Antron, Aphid Kirby, Cyber, Dana Manchester, Danny Van Heck, Henry Brennan, Iberospinus, Iron Bladesman, Joshua Mana, Panic, Radio 404, Robert Kessler, Ruben Zachariah, Swaffles is Weird, Teeny Dragator, and The Dogman.